The Rubens tube, named after 19th century physicist Henrik Rubens, is a fairly common but striking demonstration of standing waves. To the chemical engineer, it is also a pretty interesting illustration of fluid dynamics and combustion processes. Our Rubens tube consists of a 6 foot 5 inch diameter iron pipe. Down its length we've drilled uh, 61 1 16th inch diameter holes spaced 1 inch apart. On one end of the pipe we've welded a flat iron cap which should effectively reflect sound waves. But we wanted the other end of the pipe to be acoustically transparent and so we've capped that end with a mylar sheet. And then through the side of the tube, we've also added a hose barb through which we may flow flammable gas. Of course, uh, such a system has explosive potential and should only be constructed and operated by a professional. Let's take a look at the Rubens tube in action. Using a simple signal generator app, I can send a pure tone through the tube. This causes the flame heights to adjust into peaks and valleys. The distance between these peaks should correspond to the wavelength of the sound. Therefore, if I know both the frequency and the wavelength, I should be able to estimate the speed of sound within the tube. It's also interesting to note that as I decrease the amplitude but keep the frequency the same, the peaks move to where there were once valleys. So let's take a look at the theory behind the behavior of the Rubens tube. It starts off fairly simply. As we open the valve to the pressurized tank containing our liquid propane, gaseous propane fills the tube and raises the interior pressure, which we've labeled here as P sub T, to just a bit above atmospheric pressure, P sub zero. As we light the tube, we can see some indication of the flow rate through each hole by the flame height. Making several assumptions and using Bernoulli's equation, we find that that flow rate should be proportional to the square root of the pressure difference between the atmosphere and inside the tube. Now as we start pumping sound through the tube, our speaker creates pressure waves which travel down through the tube, reflect off the metal cap, and travel back. If we're at the right frequency, a high pressure peak leaving the speaker will consistently meet up with a low pressure trough returning from the cap, thereby canceling each other out and creating what we call nodes. At other locations, a high pressure peak will meet another high pressure peak, creating what we call anti-nodes. Adding these two pressures together, we end up with what we call standing waves. But notice that the average pressure down the tube remains constant, P sub T. So why is it we have these differences in flow rate down the tube? The answer can be found again in Bernoulli's equation, which tells us, again, that the velocity is proportional to the square root of the pressure difference, not simply the pressure difference. So if we were to plot the square root of the pressure difference here in blue and zoom in so we can get a closer look, you can see that when the pressure swings up at the anti-node, we get less of an increase in the flow rate than the decrease we obtain when the pressure swings down. Therefore, if we take the average of the square root of the pressure difference, we can see that on average at the anti-nodes, the flow rate is less than it is at the nodes. Now let's take a look at how things are different when we turn up the volume. As the sound becomes louder and louder, the minimum pressure inside the tube approaches and then dips below atmospheric pressure. It should be noted that the theory at this point is not yet settled. When the pressure is at its highest, a jet of fuel is ejected from the hole at the antinode. This fuel is ignited, which creates heat, which rises and carries the combustion products and unspent fuel further away from the hole. Now when the pressure swings negative, the Rubens tube cannot recapture and inhale the exact same jet that it exhaled. Instead, the vacuum draws in gases from all directions around the hole. These gases contain mainly air and some fraction of the unspent fuel. Therefore, at the antinodes there is a hysteresis where the flames reap all the benefits of the positive pressure and yet are only slightly hindered by the negative pressure. However, over time, this continual dilution of the fuel in the tube at the antinodes with air in the combustion products will lead to flame extinguishing, which we do see experimentally. Now, the theory behind the Rubens tube is actually a bit more complicated than this, if you start to consider the holes as Helmholtz resonators. However, at this point, it's probably best just to show what people want to see with the Rubens tube, which is, of course, music in flames. Mm -hmm. 